Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Does anyone know what happened yesterday? No. I, <laughs> I was not okay watching that game. I was in a lot of pain watching that game. It was one for the ages, but somehow everyone lost. Yeah, like the Red Wings almost mounted the most insane comeback in NHL regular season history, and I still left that game with just like this empty, hollow feeling. The Toronto Maple Leafs scored 10 goals in a win and somehow were the most, you know, disgraced team in the NHL that night. Because they let the Detroit Red Wings score seven on them. Five in the third period. Alternatively, you could look at it like the Detroit Red Wings, who consistently struggled the goals to score any goals, scored seven and still lost by three. <laughs> what are we, the Edmonton Oilers? <laughs> like, I think I said a joke out with like 11 minutes left in the third saying like, for what it's worth. And it was like, I think seven, six at the time. The all-time record for goals in a game is 21, and I, I jokingly said, I think they do it. I, I didn't think they'd actually make a run at it. If they took their edibles, like all both teams, because they very clearly did, 30 minutes earlier, I think they would have cleared it. Oh, they absolutely would have. Uh, so welcome to this Winged Wheel podcast before dawn. You can probably hear uh, because of Evan's deep breathing. Uh, we are recording this early in the morning again, um, where we're still in shock from last night. <laughs> but welcome to the show. Here to talk to you about Red Wings hockey, uh, a very fun uh, report on Red Wings prospects later on. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we'll be talking about one of the strangest games we've ever had the privilege of watching uh that's not the word no uh we'll be uh talking to you or sorry uh bringing on in a special guest my god it's max max is coming on the show good <laughs> friend of the, the podcast max boltman uh joined us for a really great interview summarizing his trip in sweden and giving us the scoop uh, on red wing swedish prospects that he watched over there a uh, really really fun one and then we'll be getting into a couple other things before overtime. Uh, but before all that, of course, we want to talk to you about Winged Wheel Podcast Night at the LCA Part 2. Two or uh, Adriana on Twitter was like 2WWP2 two two Night or something like that. People much funnier than me are coming up with the names, which I appreciate. Please keep those coming. Um, tickets are now available. Check the link in the description of this episode. Go to wingedwheelpodcast.com slash blog, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's lots of places you can find it. With, summer, with discounted tickets. I'm getting I'm getting there. It's in the, <laughs> it's front of mind this time. The uh the summary is we've partnered with the Detroit Red Wings once again to host an event at Little Caesars Arena. Uh the special WWP discounted tickets will gain you not only access to the Saturday, April 9th game against the Columbus Blue Jackets, uh you'll also be able to come out uh and hang out pre-game starting at 4 p.m. Uh, with the hosts of the show, and more importantly, people like Ken Daniels, Prashanth Iyer, other special guests. Uh, there's gonna, going to be a pre-game episode recording, live episode recording from Little Caesars Arena. We'll have food out. Uh, the bar will be open and grab drinks and stuff. Tons of swag and merch to give away. And then uh, after the game, we are going to have a little after party slash post-game meetup uh, venue to be announced shortly with more things to give away, more food, more drinks, more fun. That's a very quick summary. Lower bowl tickets, gondola tickets, wagon wheel podcast sections. It's a good time. Get your tickets soon. Did I miss anything? I said the discounted tickets, so I, I think I covered all of Evan's bases. Did you mention the discounted tickets? Oh, no, I don't think I have. The okay. The tickets are discounted. Okay. Uh, oh, and that oh, – sorry. No, I did forget something. Damn. Every ticket bought uh, – portion of the proceeds goes to the D Jamie Daniels Foundation, an initiative that we are very, very uh, proud to support. So that's the most important thing there. All right, let's 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 talk about the Detroit Red Wings. Think, Do we have to? I think, well, I, I think everyone needs, <laughs> I think everyone needs someone to talk to after watching that game. Oh, man. We should check on Steve. I feel like I needed a smoke after that game. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I don't smoke, but I really needed one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually uh, – I watched that game in a room with some Leafs fans in it. And they were some Leafs fans and then they, there was some like neutral and then they knew there was me, the Red Wings fan. And they were having a blast watching the emotions of that game. And look, the Red Wings started out god-awful. Like – before the third period, it would have gone down as maybe the worst Red Wings game of the year. Oh, it definitely was at the, up to that point. And really, by performance, it still was the worst Red Wings game of the year. <laughs> but you can't really say that when they scored seven. Um, and everyone was was looking at me, and they were like, "Ryan, aren't you upset?" I'm like, "I don't know, man. It's just this is the shit they do, right? You just like, you can't kill what is already dead. It's exactly that feeling." <laughs> They're going into the third period down 7-2. Nobody's playing goalie for the Red Wings. Hardly anyone's playing defense for the Red Wings. Just an absolute backbreaker of a game. And I think you said, Evan, coming into this weekend, whenever you join us, um, the Leafs getting pumped by the league-worst Montreal Canadiens was going to work against the Wings because the Leafs were going to come out angry. And it looked like they did. It started off that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mar Detroit exists in these games to just inflate Marner's value. <sighs> it was bad. It was a terrible, terrible start. Carter Rowney kept getting matched up against Austin Matthews. Yeah, they were doing that on purpose. I was just wondering if there was a lot of icings I was missing. At one at one point, I'm not even making a joke here. At one point, I checked to make sure that the game was happening in Detroit, and Detroit did have last change. Yeah. I was I kept scanning the bench to see if there was like a lot less bodies there and we just didn't know that Larkin or Suter or whoever was injured and we were just finding out at that moment they were fine fine is a word yeah that's uh not it, like health wise so let me walk you through the first two periods William Nylander scores uh early into the game off of a wicked slapper yeah, that was probably the one goal scored all game where you just like, yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I still think it shouldn't have gone in, but the way he changed the angle that shot, it almost seemed mid shot. The first thing I said was, "That's the guy every Leafs fan wants to trade." Are you kidding me? Yeah, I know. He's that was a great, and that was his twentieth on the year. They just want to trade him for a top four defenseman. That's it. They could be a three or a four guy. Doesn't matter. Hey, we hey, have a number Ronick four guy. Veronica <laughs> had four points. Let's do it. I'm ignore, on board. ignore the rest. And then, uh, you know, of course, it's the Red Wings, so Bunting put one in, and that was an early 2 nothing lead. Uh, and then Lucas Raymond, who I thought has been off the score sheet maybe in, in games where the score sheet should have reflected a better effort because he has been pretty good lately. Um, it was nice to see one go in for him. So he he cleaned up in front of the net and put in the rebound, and that was just not like a prototypical Lucas Raymond goal, but for a guy who knows how to be in the right place at the right time and bury them. It was it was good to see Lucas rewarded, and you're like, at that point, I was still like, yeah, you know what, this, this isn't looking like the Red Wings' night, but at least you know Lucas is on the board, uh, you know, uh, assists to powerhouse offensive Dynamo Mark Stahl, and then one to Philip Peronik there, and then Kopp scored, and it's three one at the end of the first, and then the second period opens with a Mitch Marner natural hat trick before the ten minute mark, <sighs> literally ha less than half of a period. <sighs> Mitch Marner, but and some of them were nice, and some most like it's, but all in all, still tough to score in the NHL. There were there was three of them though. That's that's the thing. Three. There was three of them, and at that point it's six one. And the 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 phrase going around the room I was in was Ryan. There's still half of the game left. What do you do when this happens? Got him right where we want him. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know what's going to happen? It's going to be like. 6-1 or 7-2 or something, and then the Red Wings are going to score two halfway through the third, and they're going to make you invest in the rest of the game. They're going to make you believe. And then they'll lose like 10-3 or 10-4 or something. And believe it or not, I was wrong, but just because I wasn't crazy enough. Yeah. <laughs> so the Red Wings are down 6-1, and then like clockwork, Sam Gagne comes in and nets a garbage time goal. Not garbage time goal, but like – It was garbage time at that point. <laughs> Any other game. Any other game. It always seems to be Sam Gunny, but he puts one in. Um, and then Austin Matthews. Austin Matthews scores, and this is where the normalcy, the normalcy ends. Austin Matthews scores to make it 7-2 in a, a play where he is the NHL's leading goal scorer. 
the NHL player with the highest goals per 60 over the last five years, arguably the best goal scorer on the planet today, was left open in front of the net with the only coverage on him being Pew Suter, like four or five feet away, with DeKaiser and Lindstrom both 20 feet away to the left, looking back over their shoulders at the assignment. It's one of those strategies where it's like it's so crazy. The opposing your your enemy just won't understand what's happening. It's like that football. I think it was the Colts where they moved the entire line to the right yeah. and they just had the center and it just got, it went <laughs> tragically. This is going to be brilliant. What do you mean we didn't convert? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's the game to that point. Oh, the the Red Wings pulled Nedeljkovic like I don't know how early in probably also worth noting that despite having two goals at no point in those first two periods do the Red Wings look like they even belonged in the same league as the Leafs no like in the interview with Max shortly you guys will hear us talk about uh, how relegation works in Sweden and I was watching that game going you know maybe <laughs> <laughs> the the thought running through my mind the whole time was wow this team is still they've made so many strides they've come so far but they are still so far away. <laughs> they are still so far away. And man. Yeah, it's nice having two Calder candidates. And then, you know, the, you know they, we're like, oh, yeah, the future's bright. And then you look at the teams that are contenders and they've got five of them. Yeah. Maybe I'll step into the real world. And, a little bit. Yeah. Oh. and most of them are no longer rookies, which helps. And even though we only have the two rookies that are Calder contenders. They had five points on a seven goal night. Like, I'm just saying. <laughs> what was uh, was there any ridiculous plus minus? Actually, there? if you want to count all rookies, there were seven rookie points on seven goals because Leno had two. Tyler Bertuzzi minus four and donuts across the board. He that line got caved. Yeah, yeah, not great. So do we get two firsts or three firsts for him from Toronto? Yeah. Well, he has to be able to play in Toronto first. But the moment I actually think like uh, I don't advocate I don't want Bertuzzi traded like I I hope it works out where he stays on the Red Wings just because like pure and this is not thinking like asset management this is not being forward thinking or prudent at all like emotionally I just love watching Bertuzzi on the Red Wings but any team who has troubles trouble in the playoffs should be targeting Tyler Bertuzzi all conditions removed. Um, um, I know Ontario's dropping their vaccine mandate in a lot of places in a week. Yeah, I don't the know federal works, no, but the yeah. federal ones are st are the sticking point. I think those are slower. Anyhow, I'm just saying we're maybe soon. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's seven two. I, I just want to look up the plus minus. Was anyone Lucas Raymond minus one on nineteen minutes of ice time? That feels like a miracle. Wow. Well, because oh, cause, hold on, hold on, hold, hold on. on. No, Before, hold on, hold on. If you're going to talk into plus minuses, we need to point out one thing because a lot of people are saying, well, yeah, of course, minuses are going to be low if the Leafs scored like five power play goals. The Leafs didn't have a power play. The <laughs> they whole didn't have game. A power play? The zero game. power plays and they scored well, 10 how goals. How many of the Red Wings have? Zero or one? Two, three. Oh, wow. Three. Wow. Bad night for the refs. 10 goals. No, great night for the refs. Call it as it lies. Oh, man, that's not good management. <laughs> 10 goals, zero power plays, as you were, Ryan. I actually didn't want to hold on more than you. I just find it funny when two hosts go, hold on, hold on, hold on. But they're both doing it to see who wins. Um, Moritz Sider, 25 minutes and 11 seconds leading the Red Wings. Guess his plus minus. Negative one. Plus one. Negative one. Stop making it seem worse, man. <laughs> now the wind is out of my sails. That's okay. Keep going. <laughs> Sips your coffee. Carry on. I've done my job here. <laughs> the third period opens with four... God awful Detroit Red Wings goals. Yeah, they didn't really earn most of those. <laughs> this game, and I'm not being dramatic here, but I know I always am. I am not being dramatic when I say it was the single worst display of goaltending across four separate goaltenders, some of them making multiple distinct appearances I have ever witnessed in my entire life watching hockey. <sighs> Shana posted a stat that was in the sense. Goal saved above expected was started to be tracked in 2007. There was a 9-8 Philly game, and that held the record for the worst goaltending performance because there was, like, five expected goals, and they obviously allowed, like, whatever that is, 17. So the the Red Wings Leafs expected goals was f about 4.5, and there was 
4.8. 4.8, sorry. And there was 17 goals. It wasn't 4.8 for the Leafs and like one point something for the... No, it was 4.8 total. So that should have been, based on the quality of shot, a 3-2 game. Yeah. According to Money Puck, yeah. It was since the NHL's event tracking started 15 years ago in 2007. It is the worst game in in modern NHL history. Wow. And you know what? The goalies, the goalies just didn't show up. The goalies, garbage. Plain and simple, garbage. I don't want to say because they got hung out to dry, but on top of them being trash, like they got led into the LCA six minutes before the game, and they didn't even uh, have their equipment on. They jumped to hockey the same time I do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the defense, also trash and garbage, and garbage trash. Just terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. So the, the Red Wings open the period. Heronic scores. Hey, one of hey, one of his really shitty, useless point shots finally goes in, and uh, apparently that people are talking about one of these goals being switched to Raymond. Yeah, so I was um, watching the Hockey Night Canada broadcast because obviously we're in Canada, so we we get forced to watch that feed. No, I watch Bally. I'm on TV yeah. though. I'm not on laptop. So uh, they kept talking that they expected that heroic goal. The 7-3 goal to be switched to Raymond, and I'm like, oh, it didn't look like it was tipped, and then they showed one angle, and I'm like, oh, that was definitely tipped. So I, I can't believe it hasn't been switched yet. Yeah. You know, the Wings are usually, or teams are usually good for, like, advocating for this kind of stuff, but it does look like he gets a tip in on it. If they show the behind-the-net angle of that shot, like, it it looks pretty clear. I don't know if it's just the angle of the camera and the movement of the puck, but, like, it looks like Raymond definitely tip that oh you know what i don't actually don't think he did like watching it now so puck goes over to oh yeah he definitely did he tips it yeah that's raymond's goal i think they that should, should be a Ray- raymond should have a hat trick and zero assists that should be his stat line for yeah the game. anyhow also i was still watching on tv by the way i don't sit here and stare at a tiny yeah screen. but you're like you're hooked up to it yeah, TV yeah, watching yeah, yeah. through a browser i'm watching on cbc <laughs> like there's a difference carter rowney scores and that's seven four. And at this point, another I, deflection. Yeah, at this point, I'm already tweeting Steve Dangle. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Was that when?" Like, I saw it after because, like, I have all my group chats like silenced. But then I'm like, I just saw the group chat with us and Steve, and you're just like, "Hey." <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, I think you said I'm done around seven two, and that's when you put the phone away. It was the end of the second period. I'm like, "All right, I'm going to." Tag Chris Lord, I'll do Mika's bedtime reading and all that stuff. So I'm in Mika's room. Yeah. And uh, learned to read recently. Oh. Yeah. Congrats. Thank you. So we're reading her books, and then Crystal comes in. She's like, You guys got the Wings game on in here? And I'm like, No, of course not. Why the hell would I be rushing to watch that? She's like, Well, it's 7 5 now. And I'm like, You're funny. She's like, No action. I'm like, All right, Mika, reading's done. We're going downstairs to the couch. You can lay on the couch and watch the end of this game with me. Joe Valeno was the one who made it 7-5, and that was not a tip, but just a straight-up bad goal to let in. Yep, just like, you know, those shots right along the ice from the goal line with no traffic, no deflection, un- unstoppable. I looked at my friend, and I was like, that's your Vezina candidate. <laughs> uh, and then Michael Rasmussen scored, and that was a deflection. A deflection, yep. And that's <laughs> that's that's the Red Wings getting four goals on very low percentage chances. Yeah, and that's 7-6. With, f- I think, what, 15 minutes left in the in the game? Yeah, about that. And at that point, I firmly believe that the Red Wings are doing this. Because the Leafs... Are you new here? No, no, no. Any other team, and I'd say the Red Wings will find a way to blow this. But the Leafs are the most mental team in terms of once they break down, they just implode heavily. Like an Chaotic Adam evil. Bob. Yeah. Well, just know, like... So like masochistic, like they just do this to themselves <laughs> and it's like they enjoy it. And then on the power play, the puck. No, no, that wasn't even the power play goal. No, that, that was the that was the next backbreaker. Yes. When the Red Wings made it eight, seven, we are still seven, six here. Yeah, that was the the soup goal. So seven, six. And then the seven, six one was the one that got a lot of Red Wings fans angry and the rest of hockey media confused because Ilya Mikhaev scored on a play where I think it would have stood. I 60% think it would have stood. But but you you just had one of the, are in the middle of one of the craziest comebacks in hockey history. You can't not 
challenge. The goalies aren't stopping anything. Whether you have a power... Describe the play before we start talking. Yeah, so it's just Mikheyev cutting wide on whichever pylon happened to be the Red Wings defenseman there. Uh, Cuts to the net. Kind of loses control of the puck while trying to make his move. As the puck hits, I couldn't tell if it was his skate or the Red Wings defender's skate. It kicks through... Who the... uh, Nedeljkovic at this point, I think? I don't know. It goes through his legs and rolls in the net, and... While that puck was going through the net, Mikheyev clipped Nedeljkovic's pad, and then it went in. So it was kind of which came first. Was the puck already going in, or did McKay and Mikheyev hitting his leg not matter? Which I think would have been the right answer there. But it was close enough that it we've seen goals called back for less. We've seen stupider things, yeah. Yeah, and so you... You have all this crazy momentum going for you. And then, you know, a a crappy goal like that goes in. I feel like the reason it wasn't challenged and the reason why I think it would have stood is because the puck went off of Lindstrom's skate and went in. That's why it went in. I don't know if that affects the rule, though. I don't know. Because if if the the Leaf player is knocking the goalie out of the way, like it's still a puck he does not have the opportunity to save. What I'm saying is that is why the Red Wings chose not to challenge. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know the exact wording of the rule, if there is a variation to it, if it is deflected. No one knows the goalie. It's it's like a a balk in in MLB. Either way, because one of two things happens there. You don't challenge and your momentum is just dead. Or if you do challenge... You get it right, great. You get it wrong, well, now it's, you know, us against the world mentality because the refs and the review ops just screwed us. And, yeah, we get a penalty kill, but nobody's stopping anything anyway. Who cares at that point? It's one of the very few times where I'm going to say special teams don't matter right now. No. They don't. Who cares? And uh, you could have – if you kill the penalty, hey, you got the momentum back, whatever. But I, I would have challenged. It's obviously not what blew this game, but a, a lot of people were confused that it wasn't challenged. Eight six, and we're like, oh, this, they're really they're, <laughs> we're expecting the Red Wings to score nine. Lucas Raymond from Larkin Insider buries it from the slot on a goal that should have been saved. Yep. The Red Wings' fifth goal of the game, of the period that had no business going in the net, and that made it three points for Raymond. That was Sider's second assist that continued Larkin's point streak to nine games. So six point uh, six six game point streak for Sider, nine game point streak for Larkin. And then I think at this point it was just too much. Halfway through the third, Detroit power play where we're like, oh, my God, Detroit power play at this time. We should have known. We nope. should have known. We should have known. And then the puck rings around the board. It's skipping. Moritz Sider uh, misses the stop. He it, even went down to try and stop it. Yeah. Still skipped over him. You know what? It was, it was a Moritz Sider mistake, but that was from the gods above. That was yeah. them going, okay, we've had our fun. Yeah. We've had our fun. Andre Kasha went and made it 9-7. And then Mitch Marner, who – owes the Red Wings a million a year off of his next contract because it's surely going to be $13 million after last night. Scored his fourth goal, and it was 10-7. Yeah, on uh, what might be the worst Red Wings giveaway of the year. There's been a lot of candidates, but that one's up there. Philip Ronick had a four-point night, and all I can think of is him staring at the defender splitting him and Mark, or the, the forward splitting him and Mark Stahl and just passing it right to him. He held that long enough. I actually had time to process the thought, don't do it. And then he and then he let it go. I said out loud, oh, F off before the puck, like just before the puck even touched the Toronto player's stick. Like you just knew it was where it was going. By that point in the game, everyone was mentally nowhere. Like the players were drunk off of bullshit hockey. (laughs) Yeah, it, it was fun. And like in the moment, it was great. Like it was absolutely great. But that was one of those ones like 10 minutes after the game. I got more depressed than I was when they blew it because like I was thinking back and I'm like the Red Wings scored seven goals. I don't think in a normal game any of those seven go no, in. No, 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 no. That was like – it was – it should have been like what? A 3-2 game or 5-1 yeah. or 4 – something's dumb. But like – If that game is played out exactly as it was but Igor Shesterkin is in net for the Leafs, it's 10 nothing. Like it could very legitimately be 10 nothing. Like – and, and <laughs> you know, I'm not the biggest Blash Hill fan but when he came out – after in his media availability and he didn't give a crap about the comeback and he was like that was a garbage game it was fool's gold i'm like good i i am glad that he is not taking a moral victory from that game despite it being almost the greatest comeback because 
it was bad. It was bad all around. Like, yeah, you know, Michael Rasmussen had a great tip on the cider shot. Raymond had a great tip on the Hronik shot, even though he doesn't get credit for it. Like, those are good plays when they happen, but they're not plays you can count on. They're not regularly occurring plays. You can't be like, our entire offensive strategy is we're going to fire prayers from the point and hope someone gets a stick on it. That works like once every five games. So the fact they had three in a 10-minute span should not... Yeah, this... Like, don't let the scoreline fool you. And this is like the most heavy-handed use of that term ever when there's 17 <laughs> goals. But don't let the scoreline fool you. The Red Wings came into tonight. They they weren't they weren't at the LCA. Like they their their heads are just somewhere else. It was by all rights, they're fortunate that the Leafs did something so bad as letting the Red Wings score seven goals because it took the story off of them. But I mean, the Blashill in the post game. There's a lot of thoughts about how Blashill handled some things that game, but. Let it just be said that he knows that that team played like shit last night. Yeah. Like he. Well, you don't give up 10 goals and play good. No. No. 10 even strength goals. I still can't get over that. No, one was shorthanded. <laughs> <laughs> no, at one point you had more players on the ice than yeah, the other team. Yeah, <laughs> that's. Uh... <laughs> okay. Oh, God. So, yeah. The Red Wings have a little bit of a rest here and then. Uh... No more rests. When they come off these rests, they play like that. Well, it's just a few game, a few nights, so <laughs> don't worry. It gets easier. Tuesday, March first, right against Carolina, also at home. And it gets easier after that. Yeah, and then Friday, Saturday against Tampa and Florida, back to back in the state of Florida. But then it gets really hard. Arizona, the yeah. week, yeah. So um, we're all going to mentally recover from that. While we do so, uh, before I do that, I actually do want to tell you that this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is proudly brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook. A sponsor that finally gives uh, sports fans what we really need, uh, more reasons to be excited. There are so many reasons why FanDuel is America's number one sports book, from ease of use and registration, finding your uh, best bet and deposits, to quick withdrawals. FanDuel pays your winnings back in as little as 24 hours. They're constantly running odds boosts and specials every day with some big super boosts each weekend. Listen to this. FanDuel is letting you place your first bet risk-free up to $1,000. Just place a bet on any game, and FanDuel will refund you up to $1,000 back if you don't win that first bet. No strings attached. If you win, you keep the cash. If you lose, you get up to $1,000 back in site credit. What we want you to do is download the FanDuel Sportsbook app to get started with that risk-free bet of up to $1,000. And be sure to sign up, sign up with promo code WWP so they know the Winged Wheel pod, podcast sent you. That's FanDuel Sportsbook promo code WWP. So if you took the over last night, you would be... <laughs> you took the triple over? Yeah, the triple over. You'd be happy. You must be 21 and older and present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, West Virginia, Indiana, Colorado, Iowa, Tennessee, Virginia, or Michigan. First online real money wager only. Site credit is non-withdrawable and expires in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See sportsbook.fanduel.com for details. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado, 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa, 1-800-9-WITHIN in Indiana, 1-800-GAMBLER in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Virginia, Tennessee Redline 1-800-889-9789, 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia, or call 1-800-270-7117 in Michigan. Okay, what I was getting to before... While we're all decompressing from that uh, atrocious display of hockey, depending on how you view it, why don't we tune into that interview with Max, uh, who has just recently returned from the great country of Sweden, uh, to tell us all about the Red Wings' future. So without further ado, our chat with Max Boltman of The Athletic Detroit. Enjoy. Back stateside, Max. No jet lag. Welcome home. Thank you. No, I, I, pleasant surprise for the no jet lag. It was, uh, I was worried the way there was tough, but yeah, no, I, uh, my, my body remembered Eastern time and, uh, embraced it. You're just showing off that you can do it again. So they have to keep sending you on those That's internationals. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Next one is Bora Bora. Maybe after that <laughs> is, the... <laughs> uh, folks, this is Max Boltman of the athletic Detroit, really good friend of the podcast and recently returned, uh, from an international trip to Sweden, uh, which is, just brimming with stories based on our, our pre-show conversation with Max. So, uh, Max, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I feel bad that I don't have as many of them out yet as I would like to, but I'm trying to take my time with them and also uh, get back into my actual uh, beat, which has been, you know, playing playing catch up uh, around LCA this week. But uh, I do have, for people who are subscribers, I do have some good ones coming. Um, and actually, I think the best ones are, are, are coming. So, uh, yeah, look look forward to that. And that's exactly what, exactly why we wanted you on the show today to uh, not just hype up the stories, but give people a little bit of background as to uh, what you were doing over in Sweden. So walk us through uh, your trip and and what you saw and 
yeah, let's just go from there. Yeah, so I saw a lot. So I, I went, obviously, because the Red Wings have drafted uh, heavily, we'll say, out of Frölunda, which is uh, the, the the main Swedish program in Gothenburg, the, the biggest club in Gothenburg, which is the second biggest city in Sweden. Um, and so they've got four prospects there right now. They've drafted six total in the last three years just from that one program, including Lucas Raymond, including Simon Edvinson, who is there right now. Uh, and, and they've got four guys there right now. So I went to watch those guys for a week. Um, Albert Johansson happened to come through town while I was there for a game. Uh, Nick Littstrom was there watching one of them. So it was a really good week to go. And the week I was there, I think it might have been the best week of the season I could have gone because Soderblom scored in, Elmer Soderblom scored in all four or all three games I was at. Uh, Niederbach had three goals in the first two games. Edvinson had an assist, but, and just played really well. And Liam Dover Nilsson, who's played between the J20 and the SHL team, um, all year was able to play a couple games with the SHL team while I was there. And I, and I saw him with the J20s. Um, the first, that was my most jet lag day. I got there in the second period because I was just trying to peel myself, uh, peel myself up off the, well, really, I think I, I think I was late because I was trying to find food and there's not that many like dine in options on a Sunday morning in Sweden, but I was a little late to that game, but I nonetheless saw him play, saw him score. And, and so I saw all of those guys. Um, and, and they had a good week. So it was a, a, a really awesome trip. I had never been to Europe before. I had never been certainly to a European hockey game before, which was unlike anything I had experienced before live. And it, it was awesome. So I don't know exactly like who you want me to kind of hone in on here, but I, I saw all those guys and, uh, you know, they're, they're, I certainly can see why the Red Wings like these guys. Before we get into the players, I have a question that is of utmost importance. Now that you've experienced European hockey culture, yeah, what would you bring to North America if you could? A few things, honestly. I mean, like how big of changes can I make? Because the the number one thing that jumps out, obviously, is like the supporter sections at SHL games are awesome. Like they have these chants, these big flags. They have like anthems that they sing um, like pregame. Um, and it was amazing. Like the the chanting... I still will be like just walking somewhere and have like the rhythms to their chants stuck in my head. Um, it, it was so cool. And honestly, like going back to an NHL game atmosphere after that, it's funny how many like pretty quiet moments there are over the course of a game. That does not really happen that way uh, in, in the SHL. So that would be thing number one. But there was all these kind of cool things. Like I really – so I spent the week around Furlinda and – they have this academy that really you, you go to when you're, um, I think you technically start in the academy at 16, but they have got an elite team the year before that. That's like U16. So that they kind of have these players and some players like Lucas Raymond, they have like a youth team as well. But in terms of the elite program, you're in the same program from when you're like 15 to potentially when you're 40. Like you can play at Fruland the whole way through and, and you Lundqvist is their captain now, Henrik's twin brother. Um, did that except for he took a stint off in the middle to go to North America and play a little bit in the NHL. But the, the kind of arcs that you get to see from these guys, like when I was there at any given time, like there might have been, you know, the J18 players getting ready to go to a game. Um, and you know, on the ice, they've got this big practice facility where they're all housed. So like right, right down the hallway from that is the Furlander locker room. And, um, they've got this kind of like chalkboard or I don't exactly know what the material is. It's not chalk because it doesn't erase, but like all the players who come up and like once you make the senior team, you sign it, you know, the walls, like the, the history that you, you see, like all the guys who played at the academy and then played for the senior team. I really liked that continuity. And I, I don't know how you could realistically replicate that in North America. You can't really do that for the NHL. But I think there's something really appealing about that model that like you actually can just develop a kid from 15 straight up vertically through and play for your system. I thought that was cool. I think the idea of promotion and relegation is really cool. And um, I, I think you kind of see what it you know means to, to be in the, the top league and all that. When, when you know, if you have a bad year here, you, you get the number one draft pick. If you have the worst year there, like you're going down a division and the revenue is going to drop significantly. And, and like the stakes of that, there's something appealing about that to me. So that ranges from like the manageable, let's get some, let's get some legit supporter sections over here to the complete overhaul. But there was a lot about it. I thought was really cool. 
See, you opened by saying there's no dine-in options on a Sunday morning in Sweden, <laughs> which sounds real, but w with how we know our Swedish followers and listeners are, they were going to come at you with an onslaught of here's why you're wrong. This is well, the best. Well, th there are the dine-in options. There are coffee shops and stuff. But I walked into this coffee shop and I was like, okay, great. Like I'll get a, like a breakfast. I'll get like some just, you know, bacon and toast. Just kind of, I, I, I wanted simple. I was jet lagged. And there were these like four um, young women who were sitting at the table right when I walked in. And I was like, hey, I'm, I'm really sorry. I can't read the sign uh can you tell me like is there any everyone there speaks english so it's like hilariously embarrassing as an american you go there and like everyone speaks your language you don't speak a lick of theirs yeah. so you ask them and, and i was like can you just tell me is there any meat on the menu and she looks at it and she's like um there's like salmon and i was like okay where should i go and she was like i don't know so i, I go to this like uh, like nice like hotel and I'm like, okay this place is, i see there's a restaurant in the window okay perfect i'll sit down here i'll have like a you know classic american you know give me the denny's grand slam but high end right and uh i, I go I'm back sure there they have yeah i'm sure <laughs> um there was a hard rock cafe on like the main street there called uh avenue like the avenue um anyway so I, I go in there and, and I was like, Hey, you guys open? She was like, no. And I was like, Oh shoot. Okay. Like where could I go to get like a big breakfast? Like a, I'm hungry, jet lag, blah, blah. She was like, well, I don't want to tell you to go to McDonald's. <laughs> I was like, honestly, just tell me to go to McDonald's if that's what it takes. All right. That's what I did. Uh, well, you closed by, uh, an appreciation of European hockey, uh, fan culture, which I think is, is redeemable there, but Let's let's open with the big one here, and I think this is what Red Wings fans are most wondering about at any given moment thinking about the Swedish prospects. Simon Edvinson, the real deal? Yes, uh, really good. And, and you know, it's interesting because, like, you're over here and you see a lot of, like, the clips, right? Like, our uh, our, our good buddy Robert, who runs uh, Ice Hockey Gifts, keeps everybody pretty well informed whenever Simon Edvinson or, or any of the Swedish Hockey League guys makes a big play. Um, and, and so you see all this stuff, but what I didn't, you know, I, and I've, I've watched Edvinson over video um, before, but I've never seen him in person. You, you don't really appreciate how mature and smart and good defensively his game. His defensive stick is outstanding. Um, he's a smart player. He's aggressive. He's assertive. You do see that he like has these puck skills and he can jump into a play for sure. You know, but to me, it's like the things that he does that I'm like, wow, are these like really good pinches that he, he'll pinch, he'll keep the puck and he'll go down the board and then he'll get a puck to whether it's the net or the crease or whatever and create this dangerous look. It, he's not like as chaotic, I think, as the reputation sometimes can be over here. Like I didn't see a chaotic player at all. I saw a really mature player and sometimes he makes these aggressive plays. Um, but really, I don't think I saw him get beat. Maybe. So there was one play that uh, I think you guys saw the highlights of where like he's skating backwards and the guy looks like he's going to beat him. And then he just reaches out and swipes with the long stick and knocks it off his feet. I, I'm trying to think of a play where I actually saw him get beat. And I don't think I did over three games. Um, he's really good and and defensively just much more advanced than I think I was expecting. You talked about uh, Lidstrom being there, which makes me think the Red Wings are, you know, renowned for their European scouting, yes, but in recent years for their European development system and, and Cronwall heads that up and obviously now you have Lidstrom in the mix, etc. How much do you attribute, attribute those guys taking Edvinson under their wings and and really honing him since he was drafted? Well, Lidstrom was meeting Edvinson for the first time that night. So um, that process, I think, will now start, to, which is kind of funny. Like, no, no now you're going to get Nick Lidstrom in your ear and, and he'll tell you some stuff. But I'm, I'm sure that, you know, the development staff... Um, you know, especially Nicholas Cromwell over there has, has helped for sure. I also just think, you know, Simon Edvinson seems like one of those players, you know, like it's, um, he was sixth overall pick for a reason. And I, I think he pretty much has the whole package there. I, I think he's going to be a top pair defenseman. Um, and, and I think honestly, earlier in the year, I was a little unsure, like, okay, what's his next year look like? And, you know, the cider, it was two years before he was in the NHL, um, partly because of the COVID situation for sure. But when I came home from that trip, I kind of left thinking, I think this guy's in the opening night lineup next year. And and how that works out, we'll see. Obviously, I think the majority of that decision is going to come down to training camp in the preseason and what he shows. But I just have a hard time seeing what I saw over there, knowing what the Red Wings are going to look for and, and want to be comfortable um, in him with. And 
I think they're going to see a player who's ready to go. That's what I think. It will see if I'm right. Um, part of it, I think he's going to need to get stronger. I do think that is a little bit of a prerequisite for it, but, um, having sat with him a couple of times, like I think he's someone who is going to do what it takes to, to do that. So that's what I left thinking. I, I left thinking, I think he's in the NHL next year. We'll see if I'm right or not, but, um, that's how I felt. There's one weird wrinkle with this off season leading into next season. And, um, I know predominantly the theory was Edmonton wouldn't be in the NHL next year. And obviously as this season's gone on, as you've witnessed that, that is changing. Yeah. But the world juniors are in August. And, um, I was listening to, uh, the podcast you host with Corey Pronman yep. over on the athletic and you guys were talking a lot of teams might not send their big guys to this tournament in August because they want them walking into training camp ready to go and not exhausted a couple weeks later. What should the Red Wings do if Edvinson really is that close? I don't think I would have a problem sending him because number one, like it's, it's good competition. You get to measure yourself. You get to really step up for it. You get to see how a guy is in, in those moments. You get those high pressure reps. I think those are really good things for kids to, um, especially right before they get into the NHL, you know, play your age group at the, you know, pinnacle of competition. Now you can probably debate one way or the other, like, you know, He's going to go on an SHL playoff run here. Maybe that kind of checks that box for him. Let, let's say that he plays the SHL, and, and let's say Ferlando goes all the way to the final. Maybe you decide it's it's been a lot of hockey, ran it in, like let's get your body recovered and all that stuff. I could buy that too. Um, but I wouldn't have a problem sending it. Like, you know, we, we saw in, in the very limited action how good he was there. I guess you could maybe make an argument that like if you are going in kind of in the spot that the Red Wings were with Cider this year where it's like – you know, they might not have come out and said to us, he's on the roster, but I think we all knew he was on the roster. If they end up getting in that spot with him, then that's one thing. Um, but especially if he's in a situation like Lucas Raymond was in, where it's like, you know, bring him to training camp and we'll see how it goes. I think I would send him personally, but I don't know. I mean, it, it, I think the wear and tear question is probably, would probably be the largest one for me. I mean, and how long his season goes beforehand, but. I don't know. I, I, I do get that, like, especially if you're an NHL team and you want your guys, you know, there's the injury question. There's there's all these little things. But I don't know. I, I'm generally in favor of, of play competitive hockey when you can play competitive hockey. But we'll see what they decide. So the Red Wings should also send Lucas Raymond. Got it. <laughs> so um, one other guy that I'm sure everybody wants to hear your thoughts on, uh, maybe the biggest wild card in the Red Wings prospect pipeline right now is Elmer Soderblom, the six round pick from a couple of years ago who didn't have high expectations. And uh, at one point, I don't know if he still is, was leading for London goals oh, by a healthy margin. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So what's a, what's the uh, grade, the range, the expectation for Soderblom now um, more time in the SHL grand rapids next year. Crazy theory. Does he have a shot? In training camp next year, what's uh, his path looking like at this point? I would guess that it's the AHL next year. I, I think, especially with what he's doing in the SHL, it's time for a new challenge. I don't think it's NHL ready just yet, but there's a few things about him that, um, to me, like they they might even play up in North America. Um, you know, like I, it's going to be a more physical the AHL or the NHL. Either way, it's going to be a more physically challenging league. I think because not just because of like the mindset of like hit hit hit, but just like you know the size of the average player is going to go up, and and they're going to be more than willing to try to knock over this six foot eight. You know, like I, I'm writing a story about Elmer right now, and like one of the things I looked up for it, he is the size of Isaiah Stewart, the Detroit Pistons starting center, has the exact same height and weight measurements as Elmer Suterblom, um, and there are going to be guys who want to want to try and see if they can knock him over you know what i mean um and and so uh i think that there'll be some adjustments there but the things that i saw from him that i really i mean i think everyone by now is familiar with his hands i think ever since you saw him put uh puck through his legs and score it at the world juniors twice in the same tournament that happened right twice in the same tournament yep yeah two times yeah um 
I think people knew he had good hands, but w- what I have seen from him too is a shot that is much more NHL caliber than I think I realized. I think he can score from the circles in the NHL too. Um, he's, he's learned, I think, how to use his body and protect the puck and swivel his hips and, and do all these things to, um, use his, his length and his reach. I think that gets harder in the NHL just because you have guys who are maybe more, they may not be used to six, eight, but they're a little more used to playing against six, four, six, six, whatever. They kind of know those moves and what it takes to, um, to play against them. And, and I also think, you know, they'll be of, of a little more size. And so I think it will take some time to take the next step in terms of that puck protection. Ideally, he gets a little meaner, but you never know. I've, I've met him now. He's a very nice kid. Uh, I think on the ice, you'd like him to be uh, maybe add a little bit of a mean streak to him. We'll see. But the skill and the skating and, and obviously like he's in that range where there's just really no comparison to him. I mean, Zdeno Chara is one inch taller than him. Um, and Zdeno Chara is not a forward and he doesn't have hands like that. Um, Tage Thompson is one inch shorter than him. I think Thompson's uh, feet are better. I think that is kind of the question, one of the questions with Elmer. Um, but I, I think when he gets going, he's moving really good. It, it's just, it, it's a big body. It takes a lot to, to get it going. So, um, but I left really impressed. I, I think what I personally see right now is someone who probably projects as like a scoring third line winger. Um, if he can add other elements though, like he's just gets better. So if he, Keeps getting better. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I think he's going to play, and I think he can be a third line winger personally. Um, but we'll see. Like I think the, the, what you really want to see is how he adjusts to it um, in that next style of play, that North American style of play. There's things about him, kind of a shoot first uh, mindset that I think are, are going to play well. Uh, you could make maybe make the argument. There's a couple deeks he made that he might have been better just shooting, and maybe that's something he adjusts to. Um, I, I didn't see him make a ton of like crazy passes while I was there, but I was only there for a week. These are all things he can work on, but I, I think there's a lot there, obviously. So you kind of already touched on it, and obviously Elmer's a unicorn, and yeah. there's nobody to compare him to. Tage Thompson I haven't heard before, but that's actually probably the best one I've heard. When he does come to North America, what the hell is he? Because he doesn't play like a traditional power forward despite right. being a billion feet tall. And he has the skill of a five foot ten winger. So do do the Red Wings push him to be more of a power forward when he gets over? Or do they just say, hey, he's a really, really skilled forward who's going to have a reach advantage on everybody and we're going to lean into that? Yeah, I mean, there's – it's hard for me to imagine him getting into any NHL system and the coach is not – trying at least giving it their college try to see if they can get a little bit of meanness, a little bit of power forward out of him. Right. Um, but that I think to me is where, if that happens, great. You know, like it's obviously then it's a power forward, like few, the NHL will have seen, uh, not, you know, like whatever, but, um, but even if not, I think the skill and, and puck protection and shot package is still to me, enough to play in the NHL. And again, it, it's all a question of where in the lineup. Like I, I had people asking me if I thought like, oh, is he like a top six player? Now that's still not what I necessarily think is going to happen. But, you know, it's a unique enough player. And, and to your point, brings enough elements. You could protect the puck down low. You could protect the puck kind of on the cycle or whatever, on, you know, circling the zone, whatever it might be. I don't think he's going to be able to do that as much in the NHL as, as he can in the AHL. I think it gets much tougher to do that. And I don't know that you got the requisite foot speed to do it, but if you can hold guys off, you have some element there that that's going to be really good for you. And then you can shoot the puck, which I think is a huge one um, because you know, you, you get the puck and, and you can let it go like that. Like he plays on the flank of their power. Like he's six, eight. He doesn't play the net front for, for Lunda. He plays on, on his one timer side. Like that, that is, he's a shooter. Right. And so uh those are things that I think like you see in UK. Okay. Some NHL coach is going to probably see if he can tinker with like the edges there and, and get this prototypical big man. We'll see how patient, um, you know, Detroit is like in, in bringing him to the NHL, what they want to do with him in the AHL, how willing they are to kind of, um, keep his game in sort of the way it is now versus what they want to change. I think there's always things you, you always want to be, everyone I think can be a little stronger on the puck, a little more careful with it. Um, but the things that he does, I think, I think there's a, enough elements to play in the NHL and then we'll see how much better they get. Imagine having the coordination to be six foot eight and hit a one timer. Yeah, right. (laughs) Mind boggling. So let's uh, go to the exact opposite end of the spectrum here. 
um, so a Soderblom, the complete physical package. And then there's Theodore Niederbach, who, when you watch him, none of his skills immediately jump out or jump off the ice. And yet he's productive just about everywhere he goes. And he's reasonably productive playing in the SHL, even at his young age. What's the projection looking like on him and what what's the read on him? Because, you know, with his injury history and everything, it's he's one of the tougher guys to get a gauge on. I get the impression that I saw one of his better weeks of the year. I mean, like I said, he scored three goals in the first two games I was there. I think on the season he might have eight. So, you know, already there you have to kind of take this with like a little bit of, okay, Max saw a, a good stretch from him. Um, but you're seeing, I think, yeah, eight goals on the year. Um, you're seeing, I think, creativity would be the, the number one thing that jumps up for me. I, I do think he's got really good hands, um, and, and he made a move at, at the goal line where it was like a the kind of move that you see in the NHL, a Lucas Raymond make that, you know, it, on NHL ice, you make that move and you're right at the net and you can score a goal. Um, that ice is a little bit bigger, and so I, I think you could hope that as Niederbach comes over, whether that's this year or next year, we'll see um, – Maybe his game could play up a little bit, but I do think there's a couple things, you know, play faster would be a big one um, and, and get stronger. And I think those are two things he's going to have to do. But what Niederbach, I think um, the projection there is like he's a skilled, creative player um, and we'll see how the progression continues to go. Because I think um, if I, in an ideal world, like that projection is going like, OK, top nine. Um, but you, you got to be able to beat somebody out of the top nine. And, and we've seen that over and over again. Like there's guys with skill, but if, if they're not going to play in the top nine, it gets tougher. Um, and so we'll see how that progression goes with Niederbach. I, I would say um, he's a year younger than Soderblom. And I think that makes sense, right? Like it's, uh, I, don't, I don't think Soderblom had an explosive year by any means last year. And while they're very different players, you know, I think the age adjustment matters in that calculus, especially, you know, Furland is a super deep team, deep organization. They make you kind of earn your minutes um, as a young player, even though they, they do give like a Dover Nelson who's 18. He got some minutes, like, but then he was, I think lately, I don't think he's been in the lineup the last few games as guys have gotten back from the Olympics. So um, I think it's a little earlier in his progression, but the, the, the selling points for sure are that the skill and the creativity all day. All right, now for uh, the guy you saw once, Albert Johansson. Yes, right, and and uh, he scored a really nice goal. I mean, jumping into the play, and and uh, I don't know if it was a one timer or just a quick release on it, but it was a really nice goal, and uh, and he did that in front of Nick Letstrom, which I'm sure made him feel good. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, with Albert, like it's, I don't think anyone needs me to tell him about Albert. Like it's the skating and he's got really good hands and he's aggressive. And I think that's the the package. I think it probably is a year in Grand Rapids, um, next year. Um, maybe it's a little more than a year. We'll, we'll see how it adjusts. But like the, the selling point there is like, you have this defenseman who, um, can skate. I, I think it's kind of like, he's not as sturdy as Nick Letty, but like, the, the skating skill size port like portfolio I guess kind of reminds me of that uh, that concept um, and in a younger Nick Letty obviously we're seeing Nick Letty in Detroit obviously at like age 30 31 um, and then we'll see how, if he can fill out if he can you know kind of play a little more the the tougher you know Nick Letty's the guy who played 20 minutes a night in the playoffs and so if if, if Albert Johansson becomes that I think the Red Wings are thrilled we'll see defensively if if that happens for him or not. And I think that's will be something in Grand Rapids that they see. But I also think he's going to probably get a little more power play in Grand Rapids than I saw him get with Feriestad. And for Johansson to be putting up the numbers he is without getting top power play minutes, and that would be doubly true for Edvinson, frankly, who was not on either power play for Furlunda. Um, I think it speaks to an ability to create offense at five on five, which the Red Wings certainly need. Like when I look at Johansson, I see a guy that I would, you know, I, I don't know if he's like a classic top four defenseman. I think I'd probably call him a five, like a driver on a third pair, but I do see someone, if you stuck him next to Moritz Sider and you let him bring that aggressiveness uh, and, and his speed to, to the, to that game with your best defenseman, I think that could play. I think that frees up Edvinson to play on your second pair, whether that's with Philip Peronik. I think that's what it would stand as right now. Then we're talking a few years down the line, or maybe someone, you know, jumps over Hironik in that time or, or whatever happens. You know, I think my ideal construction of a defense core is like your, your top defenseman plays with either your number four, or your number five, two, three on a, pl on a uh, play together on a pair. And then a, a good complimentary pair on the third pair. I think Johansson could be that guy that could play next to Cider if Detroit wants him to. And uh, even if I don't think he's like a, you know, 
classically sure thing top four defenseman. I think he's got that that ability, um, and we'll see whether it pans out. But but the the profile I think could fit well next to Cider, just personally. It's not like Cider has a history of elevating players on his left side. <laughs> Uh, another guy uh, who used Johansson moves, uh, I would say, uh, orders of magnitude better than uh, the, just the reference. Just yeah, <laughs> which is uh, a comfort. It's a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, speaking of positions of need, you also went to go see Liam Dover Nielsen. Is that how yeah. it's pronounced? Yeah, uh, who by all rights could project as a center. We'll see. Uh, what did you think of him? Because I'm sure you got a lot of eyes on his play as well. And we haven't heard too much about him since he was drafted. Yeah, so he played the least um, SHL minutes, of, which is, makes sense. He's really young. He's 18. Um, but to play really at all for that team at, at 18, I think, is noteworthy. And, and I thought what he showed, like he was involved in um, one really good chance around the net. He had a really good pass that sprung a teammate and drew a penalty. Really smart player. I, I would say that's skill number or uh, tool number one skill not too far behind it and competitive. And so that package, like smart, skill, competitive – Okay, we just described the Detroit Red Wings draft mantra effectively, right? Um, and so that makes a lot of sense to me why they like him. Um, and I, I liked what I saw. I think the quickness is going to be the thing for him. Um, you know, obviously the, at 18, they all need to add strength. Um, but, but, you know, and, and that will probably help leg strength wise with quickness, but getting quicker and playing quicker, that would probably be the big things that I saw. Um, but when he plays with the J20s, he's, one of, if not the best players that I saw on the ice uh, when he played with them. And so he had a nice goal. You can tell he's, you know, kind of, I, I don't know if the word is like dictating the play, but, you know, he's very much in control um, of, of certainly himself and, and has a big impact on the game. And so um, I, I like him and, and we'll see where it goes. He's a fifth round pick. Like that, it's always a little tougher to, to say what's going to happen there. But like, if you're looking for a profile, I think what I came away thinking was like kind of, Pew suitor ish if he can get a little uh, faster and maybe add a little bit of, you know, oomph to his shot, which, you know, again, both of those things, I think, strength influences. And if you can, you know, just keep improving the skating, that's kind of the profile I see. Um, and, and we'll see if he can get there. So not that we're done because we have some uh, US NTDP questions here, but uh, it's just worth calling out again to our listeners. Max has come on here and given us a ton of content regarding the Swedish Red Wings prospects and beyond, um, but that doesn't even scratch the surface of everything that Max uh, pulled in from that trip. So if you're not already subscribed to The Athletic Detroit, worth the price of admission is I've worn that statement thin, but it bears repeating. So uh, go do it. Max has has a lot of really great stuff coming out that we're uh, excited to read. We're going to have someone go to Brad's house and read it out loud for him so he can enjoy it as well. We've um, actually got a $1 a month deal. Um, depending yeah. on when this airs, I, uh, if people want, go to my Twitter at M underscore Boltman, click on any of the links that I'm tweeting, um, and you'll see a deal for a dollar a month if you want to join the athletic right now. Um, it's a good time to get on board because, you know, it locks you in for pretty much $12 for a, a year, which um, I, I think, especially between this, the draft, and obviously trade deadlines coming right up. I, per, I'm biased, but I think I think you'll feel that it's worth it. So, yeah, you have two hands up here in agreement. Um, I appreciate all that, Max. But let's bring this back stateside because yep. somehow, after all of that, you you had the energy to go uh, watch some US NTDP hockey. So, uh, walk us through a little bit of what you saw there. Well, that was an interesting one. Um, I don't know if you guys saw the score line it was 11 to 3 and it was 8 to 0 after the first period um the 18s poured it on green bay and that's a team that has some prospects too um and so yeah it was uh you never know exactly quite how to take that one like obviously toronto's in town right now right they're playing detroit saturday night so like kyle dubas was at that game and you know i, I guess i would say good thing he didn't go out of his way to to go to that game because you go and it's 8 after the first and you don't get kind of the looks that I'm sure you probably ideally want as a scout of how a guy is playing in a tight third period game, all that stuff. They, they poured it on. Um, but there are a ton of draft eligibles on that team. And I think you still can scout the tools for all that stuff. Like, um, Logan Cooley, I think is, is as advertised. I've seen him before plenty. And so I, I, I knew going in what to expect, but he, you know, it's the skating, it's the skill. He's a smart player. Um, you know, if you're going to nitpick, you know, you could probably find like, you know, how good is the shot kind of thing? How, how highly does he project at, you know, five ten or so? But to me, I think he's big enough when you, 
for for the speed and, and skill and sense to to play at, as a number one center is just what I see. I think you're gonna have to win the draft lottery to pick him one way or the other. I think he's going first or second. Um, I mean second, I, I think, but you never know. Um, who else did I see on that team? Frank Nazer is a guy that Brad asked me about right beforehand, and he's a guy who I know Red Wings fans ask me about weekly, if not more frequently. I, I think a lot of people. I don't know if it's just because. Um, He's gotten a little bit of buzz in the public scouting community. He is a local kid, Mount Clemens, um, and obviously he's playing in Plymouth. But yeah, like I, I, um, I was interested to see him in particular when I went last night because when I had seen him, I thought kind of okay, he's definitely a first rounder, like probably top twenty, maybe top fifteen. I hadn't gotten a live viewing yet where I saw like okay, I see the argument for top ten. I think I saw the argument for top 10. Um, we'll see where, like, you know, certainly toward the back half of that. But I saw the, the argument in it from what I saw yesterday. He had a couple of really nice plays around the puck a lot, wanted to shoot, um, seems competitive, seems smart. Like, I, I you know, he, he's 5'9", and that's the question is, like, what are you getting at? 5'9", um, maybe maybe 5'10". I think I saw him at 5'9 and three quarters on the Bob McKenzie list. So if he gets to 510 i don't know how big of a difference that makes there's not that many of those guys that end up as centers in the nhl um he's skinny we'll see where that goes but as a just as a pure like forward you know like i think you can say that about a lot of those guys matt savoy is not 510 um brad lambert is taller but there's questions of of is he a center or a wing anyway um so i i at least see the argument now i think for the back half of the top 10 with him um, but that team's got a lot of prospects. I mean, they've got uh, Cutter Gauthier is a guy. Jimmy Snuggerud is a guy bo- who could uh, get, you know, first round consideration as forwards. Both of them um, larger bodies, good shots. Gauthier scored two goals last night. Um, Isaac Howard had two goals. He's a smaller guy, um, but I think competes hard. He- he's a smart player. Um, Lane Hudson uh, is a little defenseman who... I tend to skew toward big body defensemen. I got a soft spot for this kid. I really, I really like him. He's really smart. He's really skilled. I, I think his edges are really good. Um, Corey and I talked about him on the athletic hockey show recently. And, you know, I, I left that one thinking like, okay, it seems like, you know, Corey's kind of point was like with at that size, is his skating good enough to manage defensively? And I think that's a, that's a fair question, but. Yeah, depending on where you are in the draft, like I think I might at least take the flyer because he's really fun to watch. Uh, his real offensive instincts are awesome. And he had he had at least one goal, almost had two goals last night. Um, Ryan Chesley, another defenseman, he's a, he's a larger body, had two big shots for goals. Um, am I missing anyone that you guys can think of? Uh, McGroarty. That's the one I wanted to ask about was McGroarty because he's listed as center left wing. He's over six feet tall and he he seems to fit the Red Wings profile of what they look for in the draft. So I, I wanted to zero in on him at yeah. some point. So here. the big question with him is his feet and they're heavy feet and there's, you know, and you see it. Um, I don't know that I would have, depending on where you're picking, um, I don't think in in Detroit's range for their first round pick, I don't think he'll be in that, you know, tier. But if you were to pick up a later first round pick toward the back half of the round or, you know, if you move up to the top of the second, if you were to make it there kind of thing. Um, but I think more likely, you know, like later in the first, if you were to pick up a second pick. Yeah. I think, I think the overall package is enough that, yeah, like I, I, I see the, um, the argument he's skilled, he's smart, he competes, he's got the heaviness to him. I don't think he's a center, but I don't, that that's okay. That's especially at that part of the draft. Like, uh, you know, the, the, the skating question I think is an interesting one because you have, guys like Jason Robertson right now in the NHL who when they have a little bit of size and the skill and sense okay maybe there's ways to overcome it um he had a a play last night where he was skating it in and it was pretty clear he wasn't gonna be able to beat the defender and so he pulled up curled hit the trailer and it was a goal and so it's like okay like I don't know how how translatable it is in terms of like how often you're getting that exact rush in those circumstances but um, I like him, and and so I think depending on where you're picking, I I I would be willing to to take him for sure, uh, in you know late first kind of kind of range. So I think the USNTDP is kind of tiered themselves in the sense that Coolian is obviously top ten, top five, almost certain. I think top they, three, like 
yeah. all day. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Nazer is going to be on the cusp of top 10. So I, I think everybody would agree Nazer is probably the Red Wings best case scenario if they're picking out of the NTDP around where they're slated to pick. Beyond that, it's you've got McGroarty and then a lot of wingers and a lot of defensemen who don't. It's not what the Red Wings need yeah. in the draft right now, but. If the Red Wings were picking in that 12, 13, 14 range and Nazer and Cooley are off the board, is there anybody on that program right now that you would comfortably select um, for Detroit, even though it may not be at a direct position of need? So you're saying they're picking in the 12 to 14 range, Cooley yeah. and Nazer are off the board. Correct. I would guess not in the, in that scenario. Um, now, if if Cooley, if, if uh, Nazer's off the board in there like that, could mean one of the more like consent. Like, where did Bob McKenzie have Nazer in his? I think he had him fourteen. Okay, yeah. So like, you know, if he's going uh, in the top eleven, like you, you maybe have someone who's slipping out of, of of that range. And so, you know, I I didn't get to watch this player. Unfortunately, I wish I would have because uh, Furlunda didn't play your garden while I was there. But I've heard really good things about Lakaramaki while I was over there. Um, Rugla, Marco Casper, that's the program where William Valinder plays right now. And, um, Cider played last year. Like he's a, a center where, you know, what's the, the top end we'll see, but he's a guy who I think goes in the teens to late first kind of like range. Um, if, if, if the Red Wings were in love with him, you know, that in that 12 to 14, I could see it. Connor Geeky is a guy uh, from Winnipeg. If he's, if you really believe, you know, he's a center and, and all that, like, you know, he hasn't had the production this year that I think you probably want out of a center. You're going to pick super high, but maybe, you know, if, if he had high production, he's probably not getting to 12 to 14. Um, and then Lambert is the card that everyone I think would love to know is, you know, you can ask, is, is that a Red Wings type pick based on the profile they've gone? I think that's a really fair question, but if you wanted to go pure ceiling, he has to be in that conversation. So, um, does that, is that what you mean, Brad? Or did you mean like, I was just kind of asking um, if there was like uh, of all the guys you mentioned between Snuggerud, right. Gauthier, Casey, if there was just one guy that is like, yeah, I the Red Wings don't need a another right-handed shooting defenseman, but is Casey good enough? Probably not. Four foot, yeah. Probably not that high from the NTDP. Um, have you guys seen Minshikov yet? Live? I haven't seen him live yet. I didn't no. know if he had come up to Kitchener or anything like that. Nope, not yet. Um, unfortunately, the ga- Ranger games I've been able to get to this year have. Uh, They've been playing not the strongest teams in terms of draft eligibility, yep. so it happens. Yeah, I think the last one I got to was Sarnia, so <laughs> nothing notable there. Yeah. All right. Um, any closing thoughts, I guess, regarding draft eligibles or prospect eligibles? I know we talked a little bit about or prospect eligibles. We talked a little bit about the uh, World Juniors probably taking place over the summer. Um Anything else that's jumping into mind for Red Wings fans to look forward to? As Well, we didn't talk about Willinder, probably because I haven't watched him live and didn't get to watch him live when I was there. Um, but when we talk about like the World Juniors resetting, they can reopen the rosters. And so it, like Willinder's having a nice year. I think a lot of people were a little surprised that he got left off by uh, at, at the earlier tournament, the Christmas tournament. I wasn't as surprised at that time because I had been at the Summer Showcase, uh, which is kind of a, a, an early summer camp for that team, and he had just looked okay. But he's having a really good year for Rugla. Um, I kind of wonder with the reset, like, does he get a look to, to now play for that team? I, I would almost think that he would with you know the way that he's played in the SHL at 19 years old. So that could be kind of something interesting if, if there's a tournament. And, you know, honestly... What will be interesting is we talked about like would the Red Wings want Edvinson to go? Like it is interesting because in Europe they're starting already in late mid to late August. Like they start sooner than than North American teams do, so that's interesting too. I don't know. It's uh, a lot of a lot of moving parts to that tournament that that uh, I guess are yet to be determined. So well, what that all adds up to is uh, we have to ramp up the Max Boltman guest visits on the show. Because hey, I'm summer. always down. One day when the Red Wings are like cup competitive, we're going to have to really find a way to adjust the, our content schedules because the latter half of the season, we all we, we're automatically talking about prospects and stuff. We're going to have to find a different time to talk about prospects. I think that you'll find a way. <laughs> I think you'll we'll, find enough content to fill the airwaves if they're contending. We'll manage. Mo Sider, should he just win the Norris or should the vote be unanimous? No, you guys are going to get to – let's just – look, guys, <laughs> this is what you can look forward to. You're going to get to – 
actually talk about like meaningful little in-game things like how should they match up this playoff series and, and all this like that's you're gonna enjoy that it's what well, you mean we're not gonna have constant deep dives about whether uh <laughs> gustav lindstrom is a number five or a number six i heard that on the last episode <laughs> it's it's kind of like i'm uh, so tired max <laughs> so tired i think <laughs> it's like being it's like having friends casually after the pandemic, it's like you forgot that this is a thing that really happens in real life. So you have to <laughs> shake off the rust. That's how I felt getting back like into the press room this week is like I got in there and I was like, oh, how do I like uh, what, what? First of all, you don't know what's been asked like for the last week. So it's like, am I going to ask a question that, that everyone just did like 10 minutes on yesterday? Um, and so like I prefaced all my questions like, sorry if you – I've already talked about this. But like uh, the, the Larkin back check against the Rangers, like, you know, all this stuff. And, and uh, you know, Verona, like what's what's going on there? And, yeah, controlled contact. Okay, sorry. My bad. But that's you, – you try to find your old rhythms and it, it takes a little bit. Well, we're in it together. Uh, Max Boltman, everyone of the Athletic Detroit. Uh, you heard him talk. Now go read his work, Max. Appreciate it, man. And enjoy the rest of your weekend. Really appreciate you guys having me on as always. See y'all at the uh, Winged Wheel Pod night, April 9, right? Oh, look at that. You're a better advertiser than I am. Hell yeah. <laughs> See you there. Okay. Welcome back. That was our interview with Max Bolton. Hope you enjoyed. That was a lot of really fantastic insight. Um, the Athletic Detroit, please keep sending Max overseas. Uh, as our uh, agent, our recon uh, officer over there, uh, him and Robert actually. Ice hockey gifts gets a lot of credit for the great work that they do with the with keeping us all up to date on the Swedish prospects. So um much appreciated and hearing like Max said it on this episode, but even the day he texted that group the the group chat and was like, Hey Edvinson, like he's the real deal. It's like, man, you don't want to hold anyone to what Cider is doing right now, because that's not gonna be fair to any prospect. Wouldn't even have been fair for Cider. Um it certainly makes you feel the same kind of way. All right. Uh, before we jump into overtime here, why don't we do our uh, segment sponsored by FanDuel called this episode, uh, Brad and Ryan make their terrible picks and you call them out for it a week and a half later as to how uh, just doing the opposite would have won you a lot of money. So this is the FanDuel segment on uh, the – what are we What are we going to talk about today? The heart trophy? Let's start with the heart trophy. Okay. I have my guy, and I feel like I'll get pretty good odds on it. Okay. So the Hart Memorial Trophy 2021-2022 betting odds. Get, take a guess at the uh, the leading candidate. According. Connor McDavid. Connor McDavid. Connor McDavid. As if the award were for best player, he would win it every year till he retires, but it's not worded that way. At a plus 210, that's a pretty safe bet. You're still making some pretty decent money. I think that's fair. Oh, yeah. That's a good line. However. However, hockey writers love a narrative. Well, the way the word the trophy's worded isn't best player in the NHL. It's most it's, valuable to the yeah, team, which opens it up to storyline. Which is also Connor McDavid. Y- yes, yes, still. Yes. But then you have some plausible deniability to talk about other people, and then you have a, a narrative. Uh, Alex Ovechkin at plus five hundred, Austin Matthews at plus five hundred, Jonathan Huberdeau at plus six fifty, Leon Draisaitl at plus seven hundred, and Igor Shesterkin at plus two thousand. There, are, there's your bet. Plus 2,000 for sure. There's your bet. That's kind of insane. I was watching the Rangers-Penguins game yesterday, which, by the way, the dichotomy that two games I watched yesterday was the 10-7 Leafs-Red Wings and then the 1-0 Rangers-Penguins game. Oh, my God. Max actually posted a picture of, like, the different scores. I saw that. I got a good laugh out of that. It was That's the most NHL thing in the world. Like, 1-0, 3-2, 2-1, 10-7. What? So... And obviously, we saw the Rangers a couple weeks ago where Shisterkin was absolutely in one against the Red Wings. Um, same thing was happening yesterday against Pittsburgh. And he's riding a 940 save percentage, and it's almost March. And while I was watching this game, Jay Fresh posted his like team expected goals percentage, and the Rangers were bottom 10 in the league. And yet, points-wise, standings-wise, they are one of the absolute best teams in the league. I struggle by the definition of the award to even come up with an argument for anybody but Igor Shesterkin right now. Even if you don't put a lot on it, like even if you at plus 2000, you don't have to put much. Yeah. Like that's an insane return for someone who's doing what Brad just said. 
in a lot of other years, he'd be higher up in the conversation and the betting lines by now. If it, like because he's not a superstar name around the NHL, because he's not more well known, and because his name's not Carey Price, he's not getting. If if his name were Carey Price right now, he's a front runner for Hart, and it's not close. Because he's in a big market. like Early years Vasilevsky vibes kind of, right? Like, yeah. doesn't really get the appreciation he should, but... Like, anybody who's paying attention knows. They get it. But, like, West Coast writers, casual hockey fans, why, how and why would they know or care, right? Which is all fair. But, like, most valuable to their team. It's Igor Shesterkin, and it's not particularly close. Best player? Oh, of course, there's a million debates up for that, but... Man, the Rangers might not be a playoff team with without him, and they're challenging for like first place. Okay, Igor Shesterkin now as is plus two thousand. Alex Ovechkin is currently a plus five hundred. What if he breaks fifty and wins the Rocket Richard? Which one? Which one is a better bet in your mind? Knowing how vote, not talking about how the yeah yeah go. yeah, knowing how voters vote. The storyline usually wins out, so that would be Ovechkin. But well, Ovechkin's got to go on a heater because he's five behind Matthews, and nice. he's also cooled off the last few weeks. So the Ovechkin narrative has calmed down. And as we know, Alex Ovechkin does he's and not been known to go on heaters. And as unfair as it is, because his press conference went exactly as we expected, there's the political storyline here, which is gonna. Uh, absolutely sour some voters i hadn't even considered that that's yeah. a really good point that is going to absolutely sour some voters and uh, and I you know what just uh, like you said 940 at this point of the year wait isn't shesterkin russian too yeah but he hasn't said shit in his, his <laughs> yeah instagram not... profile pic isn't a pick with him and putin so yeah. that's that what a year where we have to consider anyways yeah yeah a year Ryan's where... favorite topic no no it's not that it's just like it's so funny that we're like it's brad was like think of this person's previous political views of a country from a country like his home country overseas and we're like yeah that's a reasonable thing to factor in on these betting odds and it's not crazy like i'm not telling brad to shut up because it's irrelevant like it's actually important yeah, yeah. this is going to be the most my point being this is gonna be the most wide open heart trophy voting season ever just because of in terms of skaters how close that top grouping is and all the factors in like this is the year to get the crazy money lines because any one of the guys that you rhymed off could legitimately win it little sprinkle little sprinkle like little sprinkler around take put five bucks on kale mccarr at plus four thousand right now and just see who cares yeah. if you lose five bucks yeah yeah I would also like to note, um, last time we talked about the Calder, it was like Trevor Zegris minus something and Moritz Sider plus 500. It is now plus 250 for both of them. I don't yeah. think Trevor Zegris was ever a minus, but he well, was that's the narrative I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. That's my truth. Right? Yeah. But more, yeah, Moritz Sider's odds have, uh, they're tied. They're even now. Yeah. They're both at plus 250. He was plus 550 when we first talked about it. So if yeah. you had money down then. We tried to tell you. My friend texted me, and he was like, when the puck hopped over Cider's stick, he goes, oh, well, well, there goes his Calder. I was like, <laughs> well, he still has two points this period, so. Piss off, yeah. We're doing all right. The hockey doesn't count today. Uh, anyhow, that's our uh, that's our segment, our FanDuel-sponsored uh, segment. Thank you to the FanDuel Sportsbook. It is really interesting to watch these lines move over the course of the season. And it's got to be. The Norris has also tightened significantly. It was a Kale McCarr runaway, and Victor Hedman is, is right up. there now in terms of betting odds. If, it should if, still be a McCarr If runaway. McCarr's odds get any more friendly to the better, take it. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, we are actually going to jump into overtime. Uh, we're going to start off on uh, with Patreon on overtime, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. If you want to support the show, uh, big shout out to our patrons. Um, the Discord, the Patreon exclusive Discord has been a lot of fun lately. I know uh, I just I chime in from time to time. Usually I have a what I do is I go on my um, lunch break and I just scroll through and see everything that happened. And I go, you people are all insane. I'm happy you're sequestered into this insane part of the world, the Internet. Anyhow, uh Shout out to our patrons. Bill Nye, on that note, Bill Nye the Thigh Guy, uh, thank you for the jerseys, by the way. Incredible. The Shanny one is making me so happy. 
says, uh, no questions or smart ass comments. I just wanted to say the discord community is awesome, especially during game times. Definitely worth, worth the Patreon membership for anyone indecisive. As always, thanks for the great content, gents. In Eisman, we trust Cider's love, Cider's life. We didn't pay him to say that. That is true. That was just a real testimonial. Winged Wheels and Steering Wheels says, are we sure Cole Sillinger is still alive after he was Mack trucked by Sam Bennett? I did not see that. Oh. Was it a monster? Yeah. So it was... I'll, I'll find it. It was Cole Sillinger floating into the uh, floating into the zone. It was an empty net. It was late in the game. There's a lot of differing opinions on this hit. I'm, I'm curious to see what you think. Well, what do you think I'm going to think? I think we're going to think the same thing. And oh, really? Yeah. I'm kind of like, you know me, I'm an asshole. I'm, I'm just, I have caveman brain when it comes to, to big hits in hockey. So was it on the hockey subreddit by any chance? Yeah. It should be right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah oh yeah. my God. Well, when there's 17 goals in one hockey game, right. it has dominated. I'll fight it for you. So cylinder floated into the zone. He had the puck. Uh, he basically turned around to like put it into the empty net and Sam Bennett by that point already had him in his sights. And just absolutely destroyed him, like, really late into a game. I actually haven't seen the close-up of the hit. Um, I have not found it yet. So I'm I, really I'm, scrolling here. I'm sending it to you right now. Okay. And uh, I haven't seen the close-up of the hit, so I have no idea if it was head contact. So if my opinion here is stupid, then by all means, I welcome that. But just from the angle I was able to see, like, here, we can just watch it on here together. Evan. Okay. Just from the angle I was able to see, I just think like, yeah, was it unnecessary? Sure, but like, I <sighs> it wasn't an um, it wasn't a gimme. It that was not a gimme. I mean, it's six three, but that's not a gimme. That is not a gimme. You are eligible to be hit. Was it? Was he even trying to stop the goal? No. Was it necessary? No. Do I think that's part of playing in the a big boy league? And if you're gonna take put on your big boy pants. It sucks. And you know what? I, if anyone's like, Ryan, there's still four and a half minutes left in that game. Yeah. Yeah. And you're the Florida Panthers. You can come back and win that game, especially against Columbus. You, uh, that, that's fair game to me. And, you know, it's not a charge, but you could tell he was not playing the puck. No, he was not. Look, he stopped skating right here. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, I think that's just a big hit. Cole Sillinger's going to learn. He was not expecting that. No, no, he's he's sure gonna learn now. I don't know, man. I if anyone tells me, hey, look, that's how play, that's how stars get hurt. It's not like that's how people get brain injuries. Like it's not necessary. We need to just like be a little bit more reasonable, even if it's by the rule book. I can't sit here and argue with you all that much, but in my heart of hearts, my my pure, unfiltered, probably shitty opinion is he's eligible to be hit. I Keep your head violence. up, kid. I love violence. <laughs> You got to keep your head up. Mind you, again, if there's a if there's a slow-mo where that there's contact to the head, I'll change my tune. See, I wasn't sure if that was the like the Mark Shifley one. I don't think where, it's the same. Where it was like it was very obvious that he was going to bury this thing. There was no pressure coming from behind and he just trucked him. Yeah. It, it's that there was a good chance that he was going to miss that. Oh, and then the next question here is my dark horse candidate Igor Shesterkin. Well, that's Good timing. Brad's burner. Yep. Brad, Brad with multiple burners because he has the energy for that kind of stuff. Um, Joe Valeno's eyebrow says, good day. I don't, I don't know what this means. I think it's fine, but I, I think it's Australian slang, but I'm not going to say it out loud just in case we get burned. <laughs> says, still recovering after that 1967 shit show. So is Joe Valeno an underrated wild card in this team who's looking more comfortable and capable in every game he plays? I wouldn't say underrated, but the second part is absolutely true. Better and better every night. As you would expect. Yeah. Or hope to see. He is not doing, you know, a lot of more at Cider Lucas Raymond stuff, but again, I don't think you have you can hold him to that standard. If every player was on the Red Wings, every rookie, then we'd be in a good spot. Yeah, the Red Wings would be in the playoffs. Um but no, he he has been looking better every night and to center the third line and bump Rasmus into wing is a really great development. Also, what has led to Hronik's sense of puck distribution completely disappearing? De Kaiser is a constant worry, but I didn't anticipate 17 being a turnover machine to keep up the good work, lads. I think Hronik's overworked. I think he's overworked and he's asked to carry a pairing, and we had high hopes for him, but... He's like a 17-minute-a-night second-pairing defenseman who gets a 
some power play time. He should get a lot of power play time with players around him who can feed the with puck well. With a silky well. candidate centerman yeah. stapled to his his ice time. Hironik's not a bad player, and obviously his offensive impacts still have the capacity to be good and often are. His defensive game, I think, at the best of times, has looked decent. Yeah. Often, <laughs> some games a liability. We're going to have to start talking about... It's capable Phil- at best. Yeah, we're going to have to start talking about Philip Hironik pretty soon. Again, I just think the Red Wings need a better decor so he can get you know, more ozone starts about six fewer minutes a night for his own sake. Red Wings fans have been kind of seeing this for a while. The, the hype train on, on him went went away a long time ago. <clears throat> he seemed to, I wouldn't say plateaued, but he rose maybe far too quickly for his own good. Especially with no support on the team. Yeah. Jeremy Dahl says, uh, I'm going to see the Wings play first against Calgary and Edmonton after. When we booked the tickets, they weren't bo- playing the best. So, of course, Calgary has won 10 straight. Anyways, it'll be my fiance's first live Detroit game. Any suggestions to make sure she really enjoys it? Uh, also, at Jeremy's request, shout out to Chantel. Uh, Jeremy says, you're wonderful and beautiful, and I really enjoy sharing Detroit with her. I'm so I'm hoping this will hook her. Cheers, guys, and thank you. Uh, Chantel, you're engaged to a fantastic gentleman and Jeremy. and uh, you know, for all the the shit we talk about the the Red Wings and, um, you know, the season that that has been or the seasons that have been, it really is a live hockey game is a whole different experience. Live sports, yeah, in general, are way better. So those games are in Alberta, so I can't tell you a lot about going there, but wear the Red Wings jersey, enjoy. Uh, I would say a tip: talk to Chantel about uh, a few of the Red Wings' best players and zero in on them whenever they're on the ice and just show the cool stuff that they do. So even if it's a loss, you're even the good players on the other team. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, that's what I do. When we go to like Kitchener Ranger games and stuff, I'm like, this guy's drafted, this guy's drafted, this guy's at this position in scoring. And you know, and then they can kind of like comb through all the noise. Uh, and then question here from Andy H. And I just want to use this as a call out for anyone looking for this kind of information. Andy wants to know, he's looking for a, uh, to book a hotel for the game Winged Wheel Podcast Night on April 9th. Uh, check the Discord. We'll we'll add some suggestions, and those who have stayed uh, will have some more as well. Um, okay, some questions from Reddit before we wrap up. The English Nerd says, We made it through an extended midseason break without talking about how it was a perfect time to fire Blashill for the first time in about six years. Do you think Blashill can get this team within striking distance of the playoffs next year, or does he still have too many issues as a coach? Well, Brad's not here, so this makes this uh, conversation <laughs> a little bit easier um my take that brad would oh yeah i, I don't want to pigeonhole brad here but I, my take is that yeah his this coach could get the red wings within striking distance of the playoffs for sure look how close they are now yeah like are some things playing in their favor in terms of standings to to make them seem closer sure but this team's also a far car they have no they have the one of the worst defenses in the league we talked about it last episode. Without Mort Sider, that's the worst defense in the league. You know what? If the Red Wings were in the Pacific or something, I would uh, we'd be talking about the playoffs a lot more. Way more. So, yeah, I, I think I have, for example, I have problems with Blashill's deployment last night, his line matching, a lot of the decisions he made. But all in all, I think the season has been a big improvement for him. Um, I have no reason to, until I, we're shown otherwise, I have no reason to think that he can't improve as the team does. Agreed. Uh, Wingnut17 says, I have high hopes for Niederbach. Maybe the next hidden gem Swedish forward, a Zetterberg. If you guys want to offer any insight to make me sound intelligent on this one. Well, Max had a lot of good words for, for the Red Wing Swedish prospects, including Niederbach. Um, also, I, I think one thing to remember with Niederbach's development is he lost a lot of time with that you know pretty brutal knee injury. So I'm a little bit more patient with him, and as you should be. His size and the kind of game where, you know, we might be expecting him to play for the Red Wings one day, um, that's going to take time. So I think he's definitely a candidate. I don't think you were comparing him to Zetterberg, but just in case anyone is, I just he'll be better. <laughs> wow, well, yeah, let's set expectations reasonably. Twice as good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Freak Joe says, which defender would you trade Cider straight up with one for one? Imagine being Eisenman and having all other GMs calling for a one for one deal with Steve making the pick. Is there a defender you'd pull the trigger on? Gail McCarr. 
I can't remember how old Adam Fox is because he's been he's switched a few teams. Adam Fox, he's like what 25, 24. He's tw- he's 24. He just turned 24 10 days ago. I'll say no. Just because of the age difference, yeah, right? Yeah. Four, you get four more years of more at Cider. Yeah, that's huge. I'll go Kale McCarr. I wouldn't do it for Quinn Hughes. No. Uh, you're not doing it for any th- anyone like Wierenski or anything, obviously. No. Hedman's, again, that's too many years. Too much age. I, you pull the trigger on oh. Kale McCarr and that's it. Yeah, I feel like there's somebody we got to be missing. <laughs> Brent Burns, who says no. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't like Roman Yossi's too old in my books. Like he's thirty. Yeah, I don't think you. Uh, I don't think you do it. Let's look at the uh, the Norris Trophy. So McCarr's leading. Hedman, no. Fox, it's close. Yeah. Devon Taves, no. Yossi, no. Ekblad, no. I. I how old is Heiskanen, actually? Oh, he's been through a couple of playoffs. He's 22. Okay. That might be the only... I knew there was somebody we were missing. Miro Heiskanen is... That's in consideration. I still don't know, and that might... A lot of you might be screaming no, but I, I think he... Just by age difference. But then you're like, well, two years between Heiskanen and Fox. Yeah, there's not a lot there. No. Okay. Uh, we're going to wrap up this episode of the Wingwheel Podcast. We're going to uh, record our Patreon exclusive over time. Uh, we want to thank all of you for tuning in. Bat shit game. And I think we followed it up with an equivalent episode. Uh, hope you enjoyed the interview with Max as well. Thank you to our sponsor, the FanDuel Sportsbook, and to all of our listeners, including our name level sponsors. What the hell is that one name? That's the one I read out every time. I know you read them out every time, but why is it so long? Because they know I read it out. Oh, okay. <laughs> Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Garan Foundation, Nick Perks, Brett Bailey, and uh, what Evan was talking about. Terry Driver of the number 69, Ryan Cry- Crying Ryan Hannah's Banana Slam and Jamathong. I actually shortened it. There's another uh, thing appended on there. Taylor Tadgell, Matthew M. Rice, B. Diz, Boos Lobsinger, Carl Brutana Nanaluski, Chimmy, Citizen High Five, CJ Sully, Craig Kibble, Daniel Garcia, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Give Blood Fight Probert, Greech, Hana Lee, Honeysuckle Scented Farts, Hassam al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Justin and the Angry Mob, Kaylin Wood, King Tone, Kyle Hashman, Matt McKay, R.A., Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Stay Fresh Cheese Bags, Your Friendly Neighborhood, Window Peeper, Zach Spring, Andrew Bohan, Sam Bankson, Adam, I wish I could finish like Ernie, Antonio Gracias, Babe Landeskog, Ben Barron, Brad's Dad Moan, Connor Leighton, Dave W., Eric Sinkowski, Evans Bingo Card, James Laporte, Jeremiah Dobo, Jeremy Brocker, John Evans, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Logan Stahl, Matt Keeler, Matt S., Max $1 million, Reed, Revy DeLuca, Shitty Shitty Bang Bang, Terry Actual, Trevor Pebavar, Zach Handyside, and Zach McCann, a driving range superstar. Thank you all so much, and we will talk to you midweek. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.